He says, don't go out and try to pull all the bad wheat out. Just let it grow. There will come a time when we'll be able to harvest it. We'll gather up all the bad wheat in bundles and we'll burn it. And then we'll take the good wheat and we'll gather it into the Father's barn. Now, it doesn't take much ingenuity to figure out what that is, especially when the Lord gives us the interpretation beginning at verse 40. Here's what he's talking about. He says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. What did Jesus say? He said, Just like in the natural field, you let the darnel wheat and the genuine wheat grow up until harvest, then you go and you cull out the bad wheat and leave the good. You harvest the good and you burn the bad. So there's coming a day in the future when there are going to be two harvests. Now, the first harvest, of course, is the harvest of the wheat. One day, the Lord is going to harvest all of the wheat right out of this world. And the only thing that will be left will be the darnel wheat, the false wheat. I'm looking forward to that. And I often think about it this way. He's got a Christian sensitive magnet. He's going to sweep that Christian sensitive magnet over this world and he's just going to pull right out of the field all of the wheat that belongs to him. And the Bible says he's going to gather it into his barn. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's going to happen. And then the Bible says he's going to send his angels and they're going to gather up all the false wheat and bundle it up and it's going to be burned and he tells us that that is a reference to the casting of everyone who has denied Christ into a lake of fire which we know is hell that burns forever and ever. I didn't say that. God said it. It's in his book. We don't hear much about it anymore these days but it's true whether we preach it or not. I was reading this week uh, uh, someone who had written on this subject and he had a very interesting thought. He said, you know, it doesn't say that the gathering and the bundling has to happen immediately before the fire. In fact, he has some interesting thoughts. Let, let me just share a couple of things that he has, that he has written. He says, uh, as the gathering together of the tares into bundles takes place in the field, it is interesting to watch how this process of binding the tares into bundles is proceeding with amazing rapidity. Never was there a day like ours for combines and amalgamations. We see it in the commercial world in which private interests are being eliminated. Trusts and syndicates and unions and corporations dominate industry and commerce. In the social world, we have never had so many clubs and guilds and fraternities and organizations. And in the political world, we have United Nations and commonwealths and common markets. And communism is forging many nations into one block. And avowed atheistic countries want to live in peaceful coexistence with professedly Christian nations. In the religious world, the bundling together is prominent. The Christian nations and the religious world, we have now brought together coalitions of Roman Catholics and Jews and Christians and one wonders if the divine command has already gone forth gather the tares in bundles it's <laughs> an interesting thought isn't it maybe the gatherings already started the tares are being gathered together in bundles and one of these days the angels are going to come forth over this world after the wheat has been harvested and the bundles are going to be gathered up and they're going to be burned in the fire now that's the meaning of the parable Jesus said, that's how it's going to be during this age while you're waiting for the king to come back. What has he said in essence? Good and evil are going to flourish together during this age. Is that not what we see? We see good and evil flourishing together. Uh, some folks have said that good is going to overtake evil. There's no chance. We're losing ground, folks. The weeds are growing faster than the wheat. Have you noticed that? But there's going to be a continual growing together. Now, having said all of that, and having read and tried to understand the meaning of this parable, what does that mean to us? Three things. As I look over the parable and try to apply it to my own heart, here are the three things that God has said to my life. Number one, I cannot help but notice and write down in my book 
the importance of the place I occupy in the field. If the Bible is telling us the truth and and the Lord has sown His children in the field, which is the world, then how did I get where I am? God put me here. He sowed me here. I am a seed in the hand of the Lord, and He dropped me down in a little place and put me there, and He said, Bloom where you're planted. How did you get where you are? God planted you there. Isn't that an amazing thought that the, that the Father in heaven, that His Son, the Son of Man, has decided that He would sow His children in the world. And He has sown some of you into the business world. He's put you out in a secular place where all around you, the only thing there is is, is Darnell wheat, tares. God just plucked you out and put you right down there and He said, here's where you, where you belong. He's put some of you in the professional world. Some of you he's, he's sown in the educational world. Some of you are out in the insurance world. I have a friend that I meet with occasionally here in this church who's in the insurance world. He loves the Lord with all of his heart. And it may be that God is calling him into the ministry. But I keep reminding him that as important as it is that we have people who go into the ministry. And as much as I would love to see him go into the ministry, if this is what God wants him to do, he is a very successful businessman with a testimony for Jesus Christ and right now he has been sown in that part of the field and he needs to bloom where he's been planted if we could just get God's people to sense the significance of this what a difference it would make have you noticed that everybody seems to want to be somewhere else beside where they are if they're in business, they want to be in politics. If they're in politics, they want to get back into business. If they're in the ministry, they want to sell insurance. And if they're selling insurance, they're looking forward to getting into the ministry. And maybe we ought to just back up a little bit and say, Lord, is this where you've sown me? If so, I want to grow. And I want to have a purging influence on everything that goes on around me. That's the first thing. Secondly, as I read this parable, I think of the impossibility of changing the world. Do you know there was a, there's an organization, in fact many of the people in that organization are dear friends, and the leader of that organization is a friend of mine, and I understand what he means by his motto, but I think it's misleading. The motto is, come help change the world. Now the only thing wrong with that is, that's a futile task. And it's not anything God has ever called us to do. Has God called us to change the world? I remember hearing J. Vernon McGee say, God did not call me to clean up the pond. He called me to fish out of it. He's absolutely right. Isn't it interesting how we can get off the beaten path and out of focus in the command that God has given to us? He has not called us to moral rearmament. He has not called us to clean up our culture and make this a better world in which to live. Although as individual citizens of this country, we have every right to do that individually as we are able. But that has never been the focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has not called us to go and change the world. He has called us to preach the gospel to every creature in the world and call them out of the world into the church, which is the ecclesia of God, the called out ones of the Lord. And in the midst of that world, we're to be a redemptive influence for Jesus Christ. And all around us today, I see people getting caught up in this unrealistic hope that somehow we can change our world to make it a better place. Folks, we are losing ground. And you say, well, if we don't get involved in the moral rearmament of our nation, what will happen to our children and to their children's children? I am not talking about not being involved. I'm saying as citizens, we need to be involved as citizens of this country doing everything we can to see that we try to keep it on as even a keel as possible but that cannot be the focus of our spiritual motivation and our purpose for being alive on planet earth because if we get off on that direction we have lost the focus God has given us he didn't say go purge out the Darnell he said let it alone not anything you can do to keep it from growing and it's going to grow until the harvest day. And you know what I see, folks? It would have been so easy for me to do this. I almost did it. I get so exasperated when I see 
the false wheat growing and the influence that it has on everything around me, I get so exasperated. Sometimes I just want to put my Bible aside and go out and get on a soapbox and start trying to clean it up. But you know, I have a lot of friends who did that. And in their quiet moments, they tell me what a frustrating experience it's been. You know, the greatest thing God can ever do in this world is to clean up the inside of a man's heart, cause him to change, and then in some subtle way he can have a purging influence on those around him. But to go after the change of society in the name of Christ is to miss the command of our Lord. That may come as a surprise to some of you. But that's what this parable is all about. If we were to be involved in moral rearmament, the Lord would have said, Listen, you go in there and clean out that bastard wheat. You go and get it out right now. You get it out. Burn it. So that my wheat can grow. And the Lord said, No, that's not going to happen. It's just going to grow together. Please understand, the field is the world, not the church. Some folks say, well, what this means is that you should just let good doctrine and bad doctrine flourish together in the church. Well, if the field were the church, you got real problems, but the field is the world. The third thing that I learned, not only the importance of my place in the world where I've been sown, not only the impossibility of changing the world, but I learned thirdly and finally that there is an invitation to tares to become wheat. And this is kind of where the parable breaks down because Darnell wheat could never become genuine wheat. But you and I know that tares do become wheat, don't they? Let me tell you something I've learned. You know who most of the people are that are saved through our ministries? Now, we don't get a lot of people saved off Skid Row downtown. We don't have a lot of people saved out of the jails. We've just recently had an inroad into the jails. We don't have a lot of people come and know the Lord who are criminals. The people that we went to Christ, you know who they are? They're good, moral, upstanding, respected folks. Only have one major problem. <laughs> they have never received Jesus Christ as their Savior. In the language of our Lord's parable, those folks are tares. They look like wheat but they're not. Some of you are like that today. You're good, moral, righteous people. Folks talk about you as being good, and you probably are, in comparison to the world's standards. But you see, that's not the issue. The issue is the seed. What is the seed? And the joy of reading this parable and understanding it is that there is an invitation to all who are tares to become genuine wheat. In this lifetime, during this time, God is in the process of making that marvelous conversion, transferring the imitation wheat into the genuine stuff. So I want to ask you a question. Are you truly one of God's children? Are you a child of the Father? Have you been born into God's kingdom? If you have not been, then the invitation during these days is extended to you. While there is opportunity, today is the day of salvation. Today you can become a Christian. For surely there is coming a harvesting. And you don't want to be around when the angels come to gather up the bundles for the fire. Shall we pray? Lord, we pray that you will help us just to take your word and, and to apply it to our own hearts. For those, Lord, who are Christians, we pray that there may be a, a strengthening of their faith in the Lord. And for those who may wonder whether or not they are genuinely saved, I pray, Lord, today that you would give them courage to seek out the answer to that question in absolute reality and come to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that they are indeed children of the Father.